Thank you for listening, downloading, sharing, subscribing, commenting, donating, and praying for us. And for going to BrotherLance.com to get the free PDF of this teaching. BrotherLance.com It's easy to say, I want to be with God. I love God. God's awesome and wonderful and everything goes right. Mm-hmm. But when you're down on your knees, just broken to pieces, you can barely breathe and speak clearly, and you're mumbling to yourself, and you still choose the Lord. And like, God, even if you kill me, if you slay me, if this never ends, if I lose everything, I still choose you. Then you know that your faith is real. Then you know, and God knows too, it's been proven. Same thing that happened with Job. Like, you know, Satan was like, take all these things from him. And he's like, even through all that, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord. Though you slay me, I will praise you. Right? And so when we get to those points, just know it's your hour of, it could be the greatest moment in your life because you could still prove to God and Jesus, hey guys, I love you. I want you. I don't give up. I don't quit. I'm not stopping. I'm going forward. No matter what this costs me. The need for endurance has never been greater. We must understand this battle of wills. Everything in this life from the economy, entertainment, lust, and perversions is all set up to wear down the saints, grinding us all down like glass. The entire matrix is set up to break your spirit and destroy your willingness to live for and serve the Lord. This weapon of endurance, the perseverance of one's will over all obstacles and setbacks, is a morale killer for the devil. If you really want to give the devil a heartburn, stay obedient, faithful, and endure all things. Don't allow him to knock you out of the battle. Stay in the fight and press on. Jesus said, the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. Don't allow the army of God to lose another soldier of the cross. Fight, fight and bleed. Fight and die, but never stop fighting. Endure, persist, remain, and continue in on your lo- in your love for God and his children. And so all this takes endurance. All of us have to just realize the buckle up, Chuck, put on your seatbelt and just get ready for the ride and not give up. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you so much that Ophelia is here today. Thank you for my mom and Sarah and the angel and me all being able to get together and love you and worship you and if other people are able to join them too. We praise you so much, Father. We thank you for the study today. I needed it yeah, about endurance and about staying the course and, and seeing it through. So we just praise you. Please give us your Holy Spirit, guide us into your truth, help it apply it to our hearts and minds, and thank you for your love and bless all of our family members and loved ones. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, Weapons of Warfare, the series, part 12, Patient Endurance. It says, Romans, this is our focus verse, Romans 5, 1 through 5. It says, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Though whom we have, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of God's glory. Now here it is. Not only this, but we also rejoice in suffering, <laughs> knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. So you see how he sandwiches it there with all these great things, God's glory. Then he gives you the path of our walk on this earth of suffering, endurance, character, and hope. And then he ends it there again with about the Holy Spirit being poured out and given to us to encourage us, right? And so it's that sandwich. It's the middle meat we're going to talk about today. The part about suffering and endurance. And, and making it through life and not giving it up. Uh, so the Bible study, Escape from Babylon 22, Once Saved, Always Saved, complements this study well, and one would be wise to go and study that also. So before we start, I'm going to go and tell you, like, I was sitting there praying. It's been rough. I had a rough week, you know, a couple weeks, I had a rough year. But um, uh, I was sitting there praying, God, what do you what do you want to do the study on? Because I had another idea. And God was like, do what you know. And I was like, well, I know I need endurance. You know, I need like an encouragement. I need to be built up. 
you know, ministers have to be built up. Everybody needs to be encouraged. And this Bible study really did that. And so God started giving me verses and, and that's how what he does is he gives me a topic. That's yeah, that's right. And then starts giving me Bible verses to add. And this is how this came about. So this is as much for me as it is for you. Okay. Maybe more for me than it is for you. I don't know. <laughs> so it says, know your enemy, know his goals. Okay. So if we don't think the devil is a roaring lion, take him who he may devour, <clears throat> we're not going to be aware of what's actually happening to us. So that's what we need to find out. Okay. So what are what are the devil's goals? What is he trying to do? Okay. Daniel 7, 23 through 25 tells us. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms, which I believe that that's where we're living at the end days right now, and to devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it into pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall rise and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue the three kings. So this is prophecy. goes well with Revelations. Verse 25. And this is the part we want to focus on. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, blasphemy, and shall wear out the saints of the most high. That's what I, the wearing out of the saints. This is what the devil's goal is, right? If we know this is the devil's goal is to wear us down and to think change in times and laws, which we know he's doing that. He doesn't want God, people to obey God and they shall be given to his hand until a time times and a dividing of times or 1,260 years. But so here we have, what is the devil's goal? Wear us down and subdue us. So top of page two, Mark Four, 16 through 17 gives us even more, okay? And these likewise, which are sown on stony ground, whom they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. This is the parable of the four seeds. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. And afterwards, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So in that parable of the four seeds that are cast out, one of the seeds, right, was stopped on stony ground. And what did they lack? They lacked endurance. Now, what was the root cause of that? Affliction and persecution, pain and suffering, mm -hmm. right? And because when pain and suffering came, they, they got offended and left the faith, right? So we know the devil wants that. And the next one, Revelation 2, 4 through 5. But I have this against you. You have departed from your first love. The devil wants you to, because you know when you date somebody and you're in a romantic relationship with somebody and you first meet. Right. And like, uh, like I, I remember when I met my wife, I was head over heels and my wife was head over heels for me and your head spinning and you're just so happy to be with the person. You could literally just be sitting on a dirt road and you're just happy because you're with that person. Right. And and so that's why Christians is, you know, Jesus here in the book of Revelation, one of the churches said, like, you have lost your first love. Remember how much you loved me. Remember how much you loved serving me. Remember how much you just wanted to be with me and know me and understand me. And so that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to wear you out. Right. He wants affliction and persecution to get you offended, to want to walk away. And he wants to remove your first love from Jesus. So do you forget that you get so burdened down in the pain and the suffering of living a Christian life or serving God in Christ that you're just done with it? Mm -hmm. You know, and so now that we know the goal of the devil, we can be better on guard. Like, okay, this is what the devil wants me to do. This is what I tell my family. It's not always easy to know what God wants. That can be hard. It's usually not hard to figure out what the devil wants. And so if we know what the devil wants, we can go, okay, I'm not going to do that. Like when your friends try to get you to do something you're not supposed to, let's go break glass or steal a car. Yeah, you know, well, obviously that's the devil. You don't want to do that, right? Now, it's not always easy to know what the Lord wants us to do. But if we know what the devil wants, then we can go, wait, eh, man, no, we're not going to do that. So he wants us to give up basically. Okay, so understand the plot. So that put this means war it says I wanted to put these verses found in the book of Revelation to one group as we know it. Uh, it holds prophecy concerning the church and what was to come to pass at the time it was written. I believe we can really unlock the plot doing this. We find a simple message repeated throughout the book. Okay, so now that we know he wants to wear us down, he wants to just get rid of our first love, he wants us to pull, pull us away, what else does he want? Satan wishes to make you bleed to death. Revelation 13, 4 through 8. 
They worship the dragon, that's Lucifer the devil, because they gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? A mouth speaking great things and blasphemy was given to him. Authority to make war for 42 months was given. He opened his mouth for blasphemy against God, which you read about in Daniel, to blaspheme his name and in his dwelling, those who dwell in heaven. It was given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Author and uh, So if we read in Daniel 7 up above, right? He said, he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints. It's a duplicate. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. He was Because he said he opened his mouth and spoke blasphemy against God. And he was it was given to him to make war against the saints and to overcome them. So we're in battle, right? Everything that we deal with in life is from the fact that, hey, this is a battleground. The devil is out there. He's trying to wear us down. Right. And he's making war against us. So authority over every tribe, people, language and nation was given to him. So you can't run from it. Mm -hmm. All who dwell on the earth will worship them, the devil and everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been killed. So let's go to Revelation 16, five through seven. I heard the angel of the water say, water saying, you are righteous who are uh, who are and who were, O holy one, because you have judged these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve this. I heard the elders saying, yes, Lord, the almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And so the devil wants to afflict pain. He wants to ruin your life. He wants to literally kill you. But if he can't literally kill you, he'll try to spiritually kill you, right? To wear you down. Revelation 17, 5 through 6. And on a forehead, a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of the prostitutes, and the abomination of the earth. So verse 6 we're looking at, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great, great amazement, right? And then Revelation 18, 24, in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all who have been slain on the earth. So we know the plot. The plot is the devil wants us dead. Christians die every day on this face of the planet because of persecution. Right now, there is a Christian dying for their faith. You know, but the devil, if he can't kill you, he'll do it spiritually. He'll put so much pressure on you. He'll like mess up your life and, and come at you in every single different direction you can imagine. You know, especially if you're right walking with God and he can't attack you personally, he attacks everything around you. Okay, so now that we know that the devil wants to get you and get me, and he's trying to kill us, and he's trying to wear us down, he's trying to get us to remove our first love, he's trying to use affliction and persecution to get us to walk away from Jesus. Uh, resist the devil and endure until the end. Revelation, now this is all revelation. So we have this picture of the prophecy at the end time. The devil's going to kill people. He wants to get you. He wants to eat you. So this is also in Revelation. It says, resist the devil and endure until the end. Revelation 1.9. I, John, your brother, and the one who shares with you in the persecution. He shares with you in the persecution. Kingdom and endurance. Yeah, that's right. That are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony about Jesus. So John, who got the right through the power of God and the Holy Spirit, wrote the book of Revelation. He said, listen, I share in the persecution persecutions, the afflictions, the kingdom of God, and the endurance that is in Jesus, right? So he's telling us from the very start that you have to hang on and fight with all you got. Right. Revelation 2, 2 through 3, I know your works are as well as your labors and steadfast endurance. So he's talking to the churches again. He's like, and they cannot tolerate you and that you cannot tolerate evil. You've been uh, even put to test those who refer to themselves as apostles, but are not. And they have discovered that they are false. I'm also aware that you have persisted steadfastly, endured much for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. Right. So again, in the book of Revelation, what are the keys that Jesus is? He's like, listen, the devil's going to come and get you. But he's telling us here, you need endurance. You need persistence. You need not to give up. Right. Revelation 219. I know your deeds, your love, your faith and service and steadfast endurance. In fact, your more, more recent deeds are greater than the earlier ones. So again, we get the same message given to us again. Revelation 13, 9 through 10. If anyone has an ear, he, he had better listen. If anyone is meant to, uh, for captivity, into captivity, he'll go. If anyone is to be killed by the sword, then by the sword he must be killed. This requires steadfast endurance and faith from the saints. In other words, like, listen, guys, bad things are going to happen. 
you're going to go through stuff. But he's telling this, in order to endure this, you need steadfast endurance. You have to be ready to just deal and put up with it and keep pressing on. Don't give up no matter how bad it gets. Don't ever say to yourself, I can't do this anymore. I can't take this anymore. Don't ever say that. Say, God, in your power and in your will, I will endure. I will continue on. I will accomplish the goal. Uh, Revelation 14, 12 through 13. This requires the steadfast endurance of the saints. Those who obey God's commandments and hold to their faith in Jesus. Well, ain't that something? <laughs> you know, and so here we have in Revelation 14, 12 through 13. This requires the steadfast endurance of the saints. Right. So that's what we're talking about. Those who obey God's commandments and hold to their faith in Jesus. What are the two defining characteristics of the saints? They obey Jesus and they keep with endurance and faith. Right. They don't give up. Verse 13, then I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead, those who die in the Lord from this point on, or moment on. Yes, uh, says the Spirit, Say so they can rest from their hard work because their deeds will follow them, right? So here we have, in the first section, is the devil wants you to bleed to death. He wants to beat you up, smack you around. Then we have Jesus telling over and over again in the book of Revelation, endurance, 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 obedience and faith, persistence and endurance, right? So are, do we need endurance? Obviously, we need some endurance, right? And so we need to just hold on. All right. Lucifer does not want you praying. Here's why. So there's a key, right? So we're told we're being attacked. He says you're going to have to endure it. But there's something powerful that you find in the book of Revelation about prayer. And let's read it. Revelation 5, 6 through 10. I saw in the middle of the throne of the four living creatures in the middle of the elders a lamb standing as though it had been slain. That's Jesus having seven horns and seven eyes and with the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So mighty powerful. And then he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That would be God. Now, when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 uh, elders fell down before the lamb, each one having a harp, a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Right. So each one having a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. This is important. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the book to open seals for you were killed and um, by us for God with your blood out of every tribe, language, people, and nation and made us kings and priests to our God and will reign on the earth. So why are the prayers so important? We're going to read right here why it's so important. Revelation 8, 1 through 5. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood over the altar having a golden censer. Much incense was given to him, which we learned, right, that he should add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Okay, here's the kicker. Why are prayers important? The angel took the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it on the earth. Thunder, sounds, lightnings, and earthquakes. So what did we learn that was in that censer and the fire and the altar? It was the prayers of the saints. So he goes up into and he reaches in, he grabs all the uh, the burning incense and the fire and the prayers of the saints and hurls it at the earth in punishment against wickedness. Mm. That's why your prayers are so important. Like we feel sometimes we pray and it bounces off the ceiling, but God is adding it to the incense, adding that into the altars, adding it into, into the fire to create that smoke. Right. And none of that, cause you know, there's that verse where the people who have been uh, beheaded or under uh, the altar going, how long, how long, oh Lord, until you judge, you know, and redeem us from this of our persecution. Well, here we have it, you know? And so, we need endurance. We need to be praying to God. We we need to understand that our power, our prayers help empower God because everything's a spiritual warfare, right? And our participation with God empowers, you know, the Holy Spirit to go out and do more. Our resistance against God, our disobedience, and our lack of faith hinders the work of God. Okay, so we're still in the book of Revelation. That evil serpent went, wants you to give up your rewards earned in endurance. So now that you're you're enduring, you're person, you're being persecuted, you're keeping the faith, you're not giving up, you're praising the Lord, right? You're doing the work that you're supposed to be doing. Oh, the devil wants you to give this up. Revelation 11, 16 through 19. The 24 elders who sat on their thrones before God's throne fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your 
great power and reign. The nations were angry and your wrath came as did the time for the dead to be judged. And to give your bond servants the prophets their reward, as well as to the saints and those who fear your name, to the small and to the great, right? And so we have a reward coming. We don't want to give up our reward. We don't want to forfeit our reward. We don't want the, the pressures of this life and the sacrifice of the here and now to be so great that we're willing to walk away from the eternal reward waiting for us. And that's the thing. The devil wants to and, and like beat you to death and, and just discourage you and make you be crumbled up under in a ball, you know, and to forget about what is to come. And we're going to talk about that. But we have a reward if we don't quit. We don't want to give it up. All right. And let me keep reading. And to destroy those who destroy the earth. In other words, God's going to punish the wicked. God's temple that is heaven was opened. And the ark of the Lord's covenant was in his temple. Lightning, sounds, thunders, and earthquakes, and great hail followed. Let's read the next one. Revelation 19, 7 through 9. It says, let's rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And let's give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. It was given to her that she would array herself in bright, pure, fine linen, for fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That's us. He said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said to me, These are true words of God, right? And so we have this invitation through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the righteousness of Christ upon us through faith. But we also have our own personal righteousness and the righteous acts that we do for him, right? And now we have this invitation. So you just want to imagine that like you're holding the invitation in your hand and the devil's over there just trying to rip it out of your hand. He wants to get it away from you. He wants to tear it up. He wants you to destroy it. He wants you to be distracted so you don't think about it, right? But you don't, you got to keep your focus on where you're going, where we're headed, what's coming, not just what you're dealing with in the everyday pressures of life, right? Endure to receive salvation. Okay, so here we are. We went through a book of Revelation. I think the book of Revelation gives us a good picture that the devil hates us. He's making war against the saints. He wants to grind us down. We need endurance. We need to be praying. We need to be obedient. We need to have faith. And if we do all those things, we get the reward. We get the blessing. We get the what's coming for us. We will rule upon this earth that the devil is now ruling, right? But let's go on to the next section. So, these are, uh, I put these in here to help us understand the different ways we need to endure, okay? This one is endure to receive salvation. Matthew 24, 18 through 13. But all these things are the beginning of birth pains. They will deliver you up to oppression and to kill you. You will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. Then many will stumble and will deliver up one another and will hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will lead many astray because iniquity will be multiplied and the love of many will grow cold. And here it is. But he who endures to the end, the same will be saved. So what is Jesus saying? It's, it's going to take endurance, guys. It's not like this. They In modern church, they make it sound so easy. Like, oh, you just accept Jesus and that's it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to pray to him. You don't have to obey him. You don't have to love him. You don't have to share him. You don't have to do anything. You know, like they just got a, a plate and like, oh, here's your salvation plate. You don't have to do nothing. No, Jesus says, but he who endures to the end. Right. All these things that you're going to be hated and you're going to be killed and they're going to be maligned and people are going to lie to you. Your, your own family will come against you. If you endure these things, you're good. OK, Mark 13, 10 through 13. First, the gospel must be preached to all the nations. That's what we're trying to do. When they arrest you and hand you over for a trial, do not worry about who, what to speak, what to say, whatever is given you at that time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will hand over brother to death, and the father his children. Children will arise against parents and have put them to death. You will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures will be saved, right? Same thing. Let's next one. Luke 21, 16 through 19. You'll be betrayed even by your parents, brothers, relatives, friends, and they will have some of you put to death. You'll be hated by everyone because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head shall perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Mm -hmm. So you'll gain your life. You'll save your souls. You'll invest into something. But guess what? If, if it was easy, you wouldn't need endurance. Right. But he just said, listen, guys, everybody's going to hate you. Everybody's going to come against you. The nations will hate you. Your family's going to hate you. Everybody's going to be mad at you if they don't love me. Right. But he says, just endure, 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 and don't give up. Keep pressing forward. Okay. Receive salvation. 
Um, next one. So that one was receiving salvation. This one, the next one is just living as a Christian. What it takes just to be alive, mm-hmm. you know, day to day. Okay. Yeah. James 1, 2 through 4. My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials. That's a hard one to do. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect effect, so you'll be perfect and complete, not deficient in anything. So what's the point of endurance? Not only to receive salvation, to gain back your life, it says it will produce a work in you, a, a complete and defined work, right? And so what's it going to do? It have its perfect, that you'll be perfect and complete. Complete means whole, right? Prepared, that you're not wishy-washy. So like anytime we go through trying times, Two things are happening. One, it could just be an attack for the devil, but the de- God is allowing this to happen to help shave off deficiencies, shave off weaknesses, to shave off things we are attached to that are, we think make us strong, but actually are making us weak. He's trying to get down to the core of us, right? And they, so if like, if you think of a, uh, an artist with a piece of wood where they sit there and they scrape away the chips and the pieces to produce something, Right. And so this is what we're getting from this, that like your endurance, if you don't give up and you allow it to do what it's meant to do, you're going to come out a better human being, a better Christian, a better follower of Jesus Christ. Right. If you don't give up. But the devil wants you to give up. But we can't give up. Right. And if we re- remember up here at the top verse where it says endurance it, it makes character and character hope and hope does not disappoint. And so that goes with that part. But um. Let's go on to our next verse. It is boop, 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 scrolling back down. <laughs> so, um, 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 12. You, however, have followed my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, as well as the persecutions and suffering that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. I endured these persecutions and the Lord delivered me from them all. Now, in fact, all who want to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He's saying, look, guys, I'm the example. You've seen all that I have endured. You see all the pain and suffering, right? This is what you have to do in order to get to the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus says, wide is the path of destruction and narrow is the path that leads to life and very few find it. The reason why people don't want to find it, as we learn, it takes faith, it takes obedience, it takes persecution, it takes endurance, right? Because once you start going against the grain and become a problem to the devil, you get his attention. You see a lot of Christians out there that nothing happens in their life and you wonder, like, why is their life so good? Well, they don't really live out their faith. It's lip service. They're not a threat to the devil. When you become a threat to the devil and he knows that you have power in your prayers, power in your walk, that you're a light in this world, that you're salt, then he, he, you get his attention. And so what we need to understand, like my, my wife and my daughter see it because I get it 360 all around me. I'm walking, I'm doing right, but just, I get attacked by the devil. You know, it's like two or three different ways, new ways every single day. And they see it, and I and I and I tell them, and they know. I'm like, well, it's just because he can't get me directly. He's trying to get at me from other things, you know. And it's just something I live with. And I've been living with. It's tiresome, but at the same time, I know, like, when you're in battle, you don't get mad because you're getting shot at. That's why you're there. <laughs> I mean, you're there to attack the enemy and get shot at, right? And so. Um, it's just what you do. And so when we work for God or, or walk with God and things start falling apart and we feel like we're just a pin cushion for life, don't get upset about it, right? Just know that if you're right with God, that you're in the battle and the devil's trying to get you and it's a battle of your will. It's a battle of your heart. It's a battle of your mind. And if he can get you to submit in your will and your heart and your mind, then he's got you. But the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So these these periods don't always last long. They can last for a while, but they ain't going to last the rest of your life. You'll have good times that are easy and then, you know, times that are hard, you know. Next one, 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 5. So that we ourselves boast about you in the assemblies of God for your perseverance and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions which you endure. This is an obvious sign of the righteous judgment of God to end that you may be counted worthy of God's kingdom for which you suffer. So what does endurance do? It proves our worthiness. 
That's what it says. To the end that you may be counted worthy of God's kingdom for which you suffer, right? So this is an obvious sign that God is testing you like you have stuff going on in your life to prove your worthiness to be with him. It's easy to say, I want to be with God. I love God. God's awesome and wonderful and everything goes right. Mm -hmm. But when you're down on your knees, just broken to pieces, you can barely breathe and speak clearly and you're mumbling to yourself and you still choose the Lord. <laughs> And like, God, even if you kill me, if you slay me, if this never ends, if I lose everything, I still choose you. Then you know that your faith is real. Then you know, and God knows too, it's been proven. Same thing that happened with Job. Like, you know, Satan was like, take all these things from him. And he's like, even through all that, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord. Though you slay me, I will praise you. Right? And so when we get to those points, just know it's your hour of... It could be the greatest moment in your life because you could still prove to God and Jesus, hey, guys, I love you. I want you. I don't give up. I don't quit. I'm not stopping. I'm going forward no matter what this costs me. Right. And but see, we, we see this in the Israelites in their uh, journey through the wilderness. As soon as it looked hard, oh, there's giants in the land. There's the word like little ants, you know, or grasshoppers and they're giants, you know, and everybody gets dismayed and everybody starts listening. And everybody's complaining and, and they turn back and they, in their hearts, they had already turned back. I'd rather go back to Egypt where at least I got to eat than be with you, Lord. That's basically what they said, you know, and because of that. You know, they didn't get to see the promised land. The same thing is going through all of our lives where we have to make a determination. You know, you know, I love this expression. It sounds bad. Come hell or high water. I'm talking about literal hell or high water. You know, I am not turning back. I'm not giving up. I'm pressing forward. Right. If it kills me, I'm going forward. Right. But what did Jesus do? He had to do it in the garden. Right. Which we're going to talk about. You know, mm -hmm. to the point of drops of blood. And he's like, he did it for me. Can I do it for him? That's right. right. Can I carry my cross for my Lord? Can I go, hey, I'm not giving up. I'm not. I'm with you, bud. You know, me and you, you know, to the end. All right. Next one. Second Timothy two, one, two, three. You, therefore, my child, be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus that the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses commit the same to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. And so he, at what point? So this get rich quick gospel that you get in churches that God's just going to bless you with everything. This is not the gospel we find in the Bible. The the one we find that which we're reading about is be a soldier, endure suffering. You're going to be persecuted. It's going to cost you something, right? You're going to have to have skin in the game. As they say, you're going to, God's just not just giving. He's going to require of you. So he purchased you by the blood of Jesus Christ to not only be with him, but to do something for him. That is to help spread, spread his message, to spread his love, to bring more people into the fold, into the family, right? And that's how the gospel works, right? So we have to understand that, like, we don't want to become a wall. You're like, God, the battle's too hard, Lord. I'm done. I quit. I'm running away. I give up, you know, or make it stop, Lord. You know, I don't want to do this for you anymore. We can't ever be that way. We have to be like, God, give me strength. Give me endurance. Give me hope. Give me peace. Give me the power to press on. And what I've learned is when all else fails, shut your mouth don't say a thing and just lay there because when sometimes we can get so emotionally wrapped up in our, uh, our situation that we start saying dumb things like idiotic things it's better to bite your tongue and just lay flat on your face and be still before the lord and and and, and instead of saying something dumb you're gonna have to repent for later <laughs> you know and so James 5, 10 through 11. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name. Think of how we regard as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance, that you have seen the Lord's purpose, that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy, right? So he had a purpose in the uh, suffering of Job. He has a purpose in your suffering. He has a purpose in your life. And it's not what you want all the time. It, uh, believe me, <laughs> it's not what I want all the time. I mean, I don't ever wake up, man, like, Lord, give me more suffering and sacrifice you know but i'm like lord what is your will how would you like me to suffer and sacrifice if need be <laughs> you know i mean like i'm not going to run from it but at the same time he's like trust me in this 
Now, I promise you, when we get to heaven, we're not going to look back. And you go, remember on August such and such of your 2000, I had a really bad day and people were mean to me. No, you're going to be like, look at all this. This is amazing. Forget all that. I'm so happy. That's what's going to happen. Joy's going to fill your heart. I've been talking to my daughter and my kids about heaven. And they're so excited to go to heaven one day. And I was sitting there talking to my youngest daughter and uh, talking to her about it. And I was just imagining in my heart how, like, how like relieved and overwhelmed and happy that day will be. I mean, just the, the joy of it, you know, where we're all sitting around at the marriage supper land, looking at each other, just like, wow, we did it. We made it. Praise God. Right. I mean, <laughs> it feeds my soul. <laughs> and so, um, I look forward to that day big time. And if we don't keep that in our hearts, we won't make it. We don't like, we have to understand like we're on a journey. This isn't it. We're going to another destination. We're going to our promised land. And that's in the presence of our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is just momentary. Okay? 1 Peter 2, 15 through 21. For God wants you to silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. <laughs> Live as free people, not using your freedom as pretext for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor all people. Love the family of the believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Slaves, be subject to your masters with all a reverence, not only to those who are good, but gentle, uh, but also to those who are perverse. For this finds God's favor. It, if because of your conscience towards God, someone endures hardships... In suffering unjustly, which is the Christian walk, because we often suffer unjustly, for what cut is it if you sin and you're mistreated and endure it? But if you do good and suffer and so endure it, this finds favor with God. So if you're suffering an injustice in your life, a betrayal, a backstabbing, a, you know, a manipulation, you're being attacked by lies and you're being destroyed by people you thought were your friends and you endure it patiently. This gives you the favor of God. This gives you the blessing of the Lord. Like, hey, I see you. I see you. I'm marking this down. Don't forget, I, I'm going to reward you for this, okay? For, the, for to this you are called since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his footsteps. So what did he just do there? Jesus suffered without any cause of his own. He didn't do anything wrong. He's, he, it was an injustice against him. And he, so he's like, Jesus left you this as an example. What did Jesus do? What's the example? He was faithful to God. He didn't put his own will first. He said, your will, not my will be done, Lord. Right? And, he's, and he did whatever made the Father happy. That's what we have to do. We have to make the Father happy. 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 12. But you as a person dedicated to God, keep away from all that. Instead, pursue righteousness, godliness, faithfulness, love. I love how he throws this one in there. Endurance and gentleness. Compete well for the faith and lay hold of the eternal life. You are called for and made your good confession for in the presence of many witnesses. So what he said, righteousness, godliness, faithfulness, love, endurance. It's a key ingredient to the Christian walk. We have to have endurance, right? We have to look at everything that's going on and go, this won't last. This too shall pass. You know, we will get around it. But if our problems get so big that it just seems like this wall that we can't get around, get over, and it just it's just hitting us, we can become discouraged. We can feel down. We can feel let down. We can feel betrayed. We can feel a lot of things. But you have to understand God sees beyond the wall. He sees beyond the problem. He sees beyond the conflicts. And he knows the plan. But if we were wise, we would just turn around and look back at our past and see how many times those walls were there and where we're at now. Right. We have a history with God, hopefully, that we can dwell upon and go, God, you saw me through this. You saw me through that. You've always been with me. We've always made it one way or the other. I will get through this. Right. And then you'll get through it. And but the devil wants you to just magnify the wall, magnify the problems, magnify everything that's bothering you. Focus on that so intently and whiz bang power your brain where you get so tw turned around and twisted that you can't think straight. And all you see is an issue. Right. And so and it's easy to do, especially if you're dealing with issues all the time. Right. But understand, God is faithful. He is just. He's going to do it. So next one, enduring suffering to be to be uh, to better help those who suffer. Second Corinthians one, three through seven. Blessed is the God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and God of all comfort. 
who comforts us in all trouble so that we may be able to comfort those experiencing any trouble with the comfort in which we ourselves are comforted by God. So what's it saying there? We are, we are allowed to suffer, to deal with things, but it also equips us to better help those that go through the same thing. Right? It's hard to help someone who's going through a divorce if you've never gone through one. It's hard to help somebody who, who's, who's trying to survive cancer if you never did it yourself. Because you don't fully grasp all that that feels like, right? You know, or like as a minister, it's hard to comfort a minister if you haven't been one because it means a whole new set of things going on there, you know? And so whatever we're dealing in, in life, God is allowing this. So not only that we can prove our faith and prove ourselves faithful, we also can turn around and find people going through the same thing and to help them. And be like, listen, I've been through that. I know what that feels like. Let me, let me encourage you. Verse five. Just as the suffering of Christ overflows towards us, so also our comfort through Christ overflows to you. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort that you experience in your patient endurance of the same suffering that we also suffer. Don't you see that? It's like, we're doing this for you guys. We're going to do it together. We're going to suffer together. We'll make it through it. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that you share in our suffering. So also you share in our comfort. So I'm going to read it again. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort that you experience and your uh, patient endurance of the same suffering that we also suffer. And like, listen, we're here to comfort each other. I'm, we're going through it. You're going through it. We can look at each other, build each other up, love on each other, right? Every comfort I have learned through the Lord, I can share that comfort with you. Every comfort that you have learned and how to deal with this thing, you can share it with me, right? So our, if, if nothing else, our suffering equips us to help other people that suffer, right? And so we can never say our suffering is pointless or there's no reason for it because even at the least common denominator, we are now equipped to help somebody else in the same manner that we needed our help, okay? So now this one's a tough one. Nobody likes this one. This one's the hard one, okay? And during harsh discipline of God, okay? The plea of despair and for help. See if this sounds familiar to anybody. This is Lamentations. The, the Lamentations verse, which I'm about to read, is broken up because I put Hebrews in the middle of it. Okay? So, Lamentations 3, 1 through 20, says, I am the man who has experienced affliction from the rod of his wrath. This is God. He drove me into captivity and made me walk in darkness and not light. He repeatedly attacks me. He turns his hand against me all day long. He has made my moral skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and surrounded me with bitter hardships. He has made me reside in deepest darkness like those who died long ago. He has walled me in so I cannot get out, and he has weighted me down with heavy prison chains. Also, when I cry out desperately for help, he has shut out my prayer. He has blocked every road I take with all the uh, wall of hewn stones. He has m made every path impassable. To me, he is like a bear lying in an ambush, like a hidden lion stalking the prey. He has uh, obstructed my path and torn me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He drew his bow and made me the target of his arrows. He shot his arrows into my heart. I have become the laughing stock of all people. They they mockingly saw, they may, sorry, they're mocking songs all day long. He has given me my, my full, uh, my fill of bitter herbs and made me drunk with bitterness. He ground my uh, teeth in growl. He trampled me in the dust. I'm deprived of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. He said, my endurance has expired. <laughs> I have lost all hope of deliverance from the Lord. Remember my impoverished and homeless condition, which is a bitter uh, poison. I continue to think about this and I am depressed. Right. So this guy's being afflicted. He's going through stuff. God is punishing him. So let's get some understanding before we read the rest of what he has to say. Hebrews 12, through, uh, 3 through 13. Think of him who endured such opposition against himself by sinners so that you may not grow weary in your souls and give up, right? So we're understanding God's correction. So you will not grow weary in your souls and give up. You have not resisted to the point of bloodshed in your struggle against sin, like Jesus had. You, you had, and have you forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as sons? My son, do not scorn the Lord's discipline or give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he accepts. Endure your suffering as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? 
But if you do not experience discipline, something all sons have shared in, then you are an, an illegitimate and are not sons. Besides, we have experienced discipline from our earthly fathers, and we are, are respected them. And shall we not submit ourselves all the more to the Father of spirits and to receive life? For they discipline us for a little while it seemed good to them, but he does so for our benefit, that we may share in his holiness. Why are you being disciplined? Why are you being told to endure? Why are you telling don't give up so you can share in God's holiness? He is trying to make you and me like him. He does it through affliction, persecutions, disciplines. Sometimes we don't know what we're going through. We just know life is not good. But here we have the recipe that, listen, regardless of what is going through, if it's just the devil attack or the Lord's discipline in you, don't give up. Understand he loves you. He's allowing it for a purpose. You are going to become more holy. You are going to become more like him once you get through it, if you don't give up. Verse 11, now all discipline seems painful at the time and not joyful. Amen. Can I get a hallelujah? hallelujah? But later it produces the fruit of peace and righteousness for those trained by it. Whew. But later it produces, oh man, that gets me. Yeah, it does. But later it produces the fruit of peace and righteousness for those who are trained by it. Praise God. Thank Therefore, you. strengthen your listless hands and your weak knees mm -hmm. and make straight paths for your feet so that that which is lame may not be put out of joint, but be healed. Amen. So now here we have is like, in the first part of Lamentation, and God's like, oh, God, I am chewed up. I am nothing. I'm a worm. I'm dust. I'm, I feel like I'm just being destroyed here in Hebrews uh, 12. He says, listen, this is happening because God loves you. Because he's trying to make you like him. He's trying to get rid of that bad things in your life that you've clung on to that he knows is actually hindering your walk with him. Okay? So let's read the rest of where we left off in Lamentations, top of page 7. Lamentations 3, 21 through 34. But this I call to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord, he's, he's, he's building himself up here. He's, he's reminding himself. He's like, I'm feeling all these horrible emotions. My life is horrible, Lord. But here he goes on and he starts reminding himself who God is. The Lord's loyal kindness never ceases. His compassion never ends. They are fresh every morning. Your faithfulness is abundant. My portion is the Lord's. I have said to myself, so I'll put my hope in him. The Lord is good to those who trust in him, to the, uh, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait patiently for deliverance from the Lord. It is good for a man to bear their yoke while he is young. Let a person sit alone in silence when the Lord is disciplining him. That's what we just learned about. Let him bury his face in the dust. Perhaps there is hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who hits him. In other words, don't resist God's correction. Let him have his fill of insults, for the Lord will not reject us forever. Though he causes us grief, he then has compassion on us according to who. He then has compassion on us according to the abundance of his loyal kindness. For he is not predis predisposed to afflict or to grieve people, to crush underfoot all the earth's prisoners. Yeah. Right? And so God, in other words, God doesn't want to do this. Don't resist him. You ever try to spank a kid that's trying to get away from you? Worse. It makes it worse, not only for you, but for the kid, because now you have to discipline him for resisting the discipline. So he's saying, like, guys, just humble yourself. Stop fighting against it. He's like, don't. This is like, I love that. Just give him your face. Give him the other cheek. If he wants to slap you on both cheeks, let him do it. Right? It's like, and just know that it's not going to last forever. You're not going to be here forever. God is doing it to restore you, to build you up again, to put you back where you need to be, to be more like him. Amen. Right? Where we don't have to sit there and wonder, God, why is all these bad things happen to me? No, Paul says that, that, that always say, you know, to rejoice in everything because that's the will of God. Give thanks and persecutions and blessings. It doesn't matter what it is. Always be giving thanks. Thank you, God, that this is happening. Thank you that I'm learning this lesson. Thank you that I'm having to endure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because we don't our finite minds can't fully understand exactly what's going on. Right. Like me trying to tell my four, a four year old kid why they don't put the finger in the light socket. 
right? He just needs to trust me. I can't explain how electricity works and being grounded and all these things, right? So God is like, listen, if I discipline you or if you're persecuted, just know you're going to be rewarded. In persecution, he says, whatever you give up for him in this life or the next hundredfold pressed down overflowing here in discipline, he says, I give you holiness in my discipline. You're never going to come out the other side of these things on the, on the negative, right? And even in our suffering, if we don't know what to do with it, we can help people. So there's like, there's never like this point where like, this is hopeless. Something is transpiring. Something is happening. Something is working out. We just have to have confidence that the God who loves us, the God who sacrificed his own son for us is doing something good for us, even if it doesn't feel good. You're right. But Christians are so averse to feeling not good that they ignore God and they ignore his discipline and they won't allow themselves to be humble. They won't submit before the God and let him rise us up. Right. And that's why many people at the end of time are going to lose their faith because they've never been disciplined by God. They won't allow it. They run from it. They reject him in it. And they're like, no, this can't be God. No, that's not what the Bible says. OK, next one is enduring to serve God. This one's for me, man. And now we want to know what it's like to serve God. We just talked about this plan. That's what it means to serve God, how we need to endure. Second Timothy two, eight through 13. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead of the offspring of David, according to my good news, in which I suffer hardships to the point of chains as a criminal. But God's word isn't chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the chosen one's sake. In other words, for all of you, that they also may obtain the salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Praise God. He said, I will endure all things to try to help save the chosen few, the people of God. Right? He's like, I'm I'm giving up all these things. And, and he gives a list, which we're about to read, of all the stuff he went through. And at no point is he you hear Paul going, God, where are you? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? Haven't I done these great, wonderful things? Right. Paul should have been, like we think that if we're always obedient to God. We always do right things. Good things always happen. You don't find that in the Bible. Where did, like Jesus died for your sins. Jesus was homeless. Jesus didn't have food. If there's one person on the face of the planet that should have had all of his needs met, it would have been Jesus. But it didn't happen. They had to go into the fields to get food out of the, uh, the corn stalks and stuff on the Sabbath because they had no food. You know, he said, uh, foxes have den, you know, foxes and stuff have holes, but I have no place to lay my head. No home. Right. But if there's one person who did everything right and we think if we do all things right, all things work out for everything to make me happy and to make my life what I want it to be. You don't find that in the Bible. It's just not there. What you find is I am with you no matter where you go. I will never leave you. I am looking after you. Praise God. Go. Do it. This thing is trustworthy. For if we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we also reign with him. I love that. If we endure, we also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Right. So I love this. For if we died with him, we also live with him. In other words, let's carry your cross. Do what I'm doing. Share the gospel no matter what it costs you. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. Don't quit. <laughs> my book, We Shall Be Like Him. It's on my brotherlance.com. We shall be like him.com. It's free. You can read it online. Tells you exactly what you get in heaven. It's a lot, guys. You don't want to give it up. Right. So let's see all that pain and suffering that Paul went through. He gives us a list. Second Corinthians six, four through 13, 13. But as God's servant, we have commended ourselves in every way with great endurance, with great endurance, with great endurance. And here's why. In persecutions, in difficulties, in distress, in beatings, imprisonments, in riots, in troubles, in sleepless nights, in hunger, 
by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by benevolence, by the Holy Spirit, by genuine love, by truthful teaching, by the power of God and the weapons of righteousness, both for the right hand and for the left, through glory and, and, and dishonor, through slander and praise, regarded as impostors and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet see. We continue to live as those who are scourged and are not executed, uh, and, and yet not executed, as sorrowful but always rejoicing, as poor but making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart has been opened wide to you. Our affliction for you is not restricted, but you are restricting in your afflictions for us. In other words, you are not joining us. Now, as a fair exchange, I speak to my children. Open wide your hearts to us also. Right? And so there's uh, another list Paul wrote about being and beaten and then thrown in the dash of fasting and all these things. But this one is great because if you look in there, he sandwiches it. I'm going to read it again. I'm going to point it out this time. It says, We have commended ourselves in every way with great endurance and persecutions, difficulties, distress, and beatings, imprisonments, riots, and troubles, sleepless nights and hungers by purity. Right? And so, here we go. By purity, by knowledge, by patience, benevolence, by the Holy Spirit, by genuine love, by truthful teaching, by the power of God, with their weapons of righteousness, both for the right hand and for the left. Right? And so, what are you saying? Like, listen. He just stacked up. We're suffering all these things because we're doing all these things, right? And through glory and dishonor. So he's like, and through slander and praise, regard as impostors, yet true. In other words, people are maligning us. They're hating us. We're doing all these things for you guys so you guys can receive salvation, right? And so we have to understand that we don't want to think that when we serve God, bad things will never happen because it's happening to Christians all around the world today. Right. I read in my devotions this morning about a, a gentleman who was in um, China, I believe, and uh, he was ministering to people and he had such a ministry that uh, he oh, it wasn't China. It was another country. Sorry. But he was ministering to these people. I think it was uh, it doesn't matter. Either way, he was ministering to people that the government said you couldn't minister to. They beat him up, dragged him off to prison and, and, and of course, beat on him and stuff. And because he's saying a Christian song in prison, they added more to his sins. And then all the uh, ministries got together and put pressure on the government to release this guy. He had a wife and kids. And they were able to release, uh, uh, make his sentence six months shorter. He refused to leave. He's like, I don't want to leave. I have such a mission field inside this prison right now. I am, So many people are being changed and saved. He denied himself. He denied his freedom. He denied his own family, his presence, to save souls that he would never, otherwise would be able to reach. Wow. Wow. Right. Praise God. It's That's the mindset that God, whatever it costs for you. And this is what God put on my heart. It is stupidity to... Go against the God who gave you everything to try to retain everything he gave you. It's stupid to go against the God who gave you everything to try to retain what that God gave you. My family, my house, my blessings, everything I have is from God. It's the stupidest thing to think I can go against God's will and keep all those blessings. You can't go against God and keep what he blessed you with. He will take it from you. But many Christians think they can deny God and still keep all of his blessings. Right. It doesn't happen. Right. And so what we need to understand that whatever he can't, I, like, I can't do this with God. Like, no, you can't have this. I give you everything but this thing. Because what happens is like you'll, ha you'll lose everything. He'll take it all. Like, who are we fooling? How can we really resist God? We can't. It's only because God has grace and mercy. People think they get away with it for a time because he's given them time to repent. But ultimately, he'll just cut your hands off and you lose it all. I mean, so you can't resist, right? Okay, next one. First Thessalonians 1, 2 through 5. We thank God always for all of you, as mentioned, you constantly in prayer, because we recall in the presence of our God and Father, your work of faith and labor, of love and endurance and of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We know, brothers and sisters, uh, loved by God, that you have cho uh, that he has chosen you and that our gospel did not come to you merely in words, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with a deep conviction. Surely you recall the character we displayed when we came among you to help you. So what are you saying? faith, labor of love, endurance, and hope in Jesus Christ, right? Top of page eight. Second Timothy four, five through eight. But you watch in all things, endure affliction, 
Do the work of an evangelist. Fully carry out your ministry. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Fully carry out your ministry. For I am already poured out, and then the time of my release is here. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at the day, and not to me only, but also to all those who love his appearing. Right? So we're saying as we serve the Lord, it says just endure. Endure. Don't stop. Don't quit. What did you just said? You're not worthy of the kingdom of heaven if you don't put both hands to the plow. Right. You can't put one hand to the plow and look back and make a straight line. Mm -mm. You'll just go in circles. You'll pull the bowl in circles, you know, and you'll go back to your original destination. And so what we have to understand as Christians, we have to just buckle up, get ready, and just press in. And if the battle gets hard, you don't quit. You keep pressing in. When it seems like you can't bear it anymore, don't worry. Just keep pressing in and don't run from it. All right, next one. Don't lose heart. 1 Corinthians 9, 23 through 27. I do all things because of the gospel so that I can be a participant in it. I can I do all these things because of the gospel that I can be a participant in it. Do you not know that all the runners in the stadium keep compete, but only, uh, only one receives the prize? So run to win. Each competitor must exercise self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run uncertainly or box like one who hits the only air. Instead, I subdue my body and make it my slave so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Right? In other words, we have to do it. We run the race. We understand we're in a competition. We're not giving up. We're not turning back. We see the goal ahead of us, and we're not going to let the devil trip us up and get us turned around and get off the path. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So then, dear brothers and sisters, be firm. Do not be removed. Always be outstanding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I love that. Your labor is not in vain. Man, sometimes, I'll be honest with you guys, sometimes I feel like, God, what am I even doing? It's like, now sometimes I get no response from anybody on anything, and I, I send out texts and stuff. I'm like, you know, it's like yelling into a void. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know. and the wall. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, and so, but the, here it says your labor is not in vain because some water, some plant, God gives the increase, right? So if you're planting or watering, it, it's God that brings the return. So it might seem like we're just wasting our time praying for people, wasting our time trying to minister to people, wasting our time trying to bring people to the Lord. It seems a lot of it can just seem like a giant waste of time because we're not seeing the results that we want in their lives. We're not seeing them, you know, come up in it and learn and grow, but we don't understand we go out to water and we get that four row ground and it's hard packed because of drought and you sit there and just chip at it. And it's like almost like concrete and you're just chipping and chipping and chipping and chipping, you know, just trying to get to moist soil. And that's what it's like sometimes with people. Sometimes they're so hard, so callous that all you can do is chip and rub a little dirt off for the next person that comes into their life. Cause you know, they're just so bound up in it. You know, but it says, don't be discouraged. Don't go weary. You know, your labor is not in vain. Don't give up. Second Chronicles uh, 15, seven. But as for you, be strong and don't get discouraged for your work will be rewarded. Right. So everything you're going through, your faithfulness, your commitment to God and Jesus, your willingness to pray for people, to share the gospel. God is taking account of it. Just imagine, you know, you ever work for a job and the, you get the you get the cruddy job, like go clean out the barn or go, you know, muck the stalls, you know, or go, you know, just wash out the buckets, right? But here's the thing, guys, you got you went on the clock, you agreed to X amount of dollars an hour, twenty dollars an hour. It doesn't matter what you're doing, your pay is the same. It might not seem glorious. It might not be awesome. It might not be what you want, but your pay is the same because you went in at a certain wage as the parable gives, you know, about all the workers that lined up and agreed to a wage. So if God has you doing the, the simplest, stupidest looking thing that just annoys you, don't worry about it. Pay's the same. You know, he might have you up in front of a million people. Pay's the same. That pays the same. It all pays the same. You know, and so we don't get discouraged in like what the, the calling is and what the work is. Like, I like, 
you know, wonder, I'm like, God, we have so much good information. We have such good teaching. This so biblically sound and this great mystery is revealed. Why isn't this going bigger? Why, why aren't more people grasping on it? But Jesus said they'll heap up itching ears, you know, leader, teachers to teach them things they want to hear. They won't have a love for the truth. Their hearts are going to go cold, right? So what do we do? We are saying things that God just wants to be said so he could say they were said. It doesn't mean that it's going to have a big audience. It's just, it's been said. God's like, I, it was out there. I gave you the truth. You could have had it. You rejected it. It's been said. You have no excuse, right? And if you look at all the prophets, how many prophets really had successful ministry? You know, you got Jonah. He had a successful ministry and it drove him mad. You know, got people to repent and turn back to God and he was mad about it. But the rest of them, they basically get killed and slaughtered and beat up. And I mean, but God wanted it said, right? And so we can't get discouraged with the outcome. I heard a coach, um, uh, the coach for uh, the Oklahoma Sooners, say something that really hit me like square in the eye. He says, when the coaches want something more for the players than what the players want, it's really draining. Mm -hmm. I was like, boom. I was like, that explains it all. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's an, on another level. I want so much for people. But also it's another level. Because like I want so much for people, not just for them, but I want my God and my father to be loved by them. You ever have somebody that you really like and you want other people to like them and to be their friend. Yes. Right. And, and it hurts you that they won't be. And you're like, this person's amazing. Why won't you pay attention to them? They're, they're great people, you know, and you're just doing everything. You're, that's how I feel. I'm like, God, I just want people to love you. I want people to worship you. I want people to follow after you. I want people to be on fire for you because you're worthy of it. And it hurts so bad when people come and go and they get on fire for a little bit and fall off. I mean, it just hurts me. I'm like, why can't you guys love God? What, what, what is there not the like? What is there not the love? You know, and it, it, it's tiring. It's, it, it's like, God, what is going on here? You know, how do we get people to get in love with you? You know, so. I don't know. Galatians 6, 9 through 10. We must not grow weary in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not give up. So then, whatever, whenever we have opportunity, let us do good to all, and especially to those who belong to the family of faith. Right? So, don't give up. Don't grow weary. The enduring keys. As we read in Revelation, prayer is a big key. We don't want to forget this. Okay? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, love does not brag, is not puffed up, it is not rude, it's not self-serving, it is not easily angered or resentful, it is not glad about injustice, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things. Yeah. So if you love Jesus, you're going to bear all things for him, believe all of his promises, hope in all of his words and endure all things for him. Right. right. And that's how we have to be. And that's a key. So we got two more keys after this. So I put part A and part B because they go together. Second Thessalonians three, three through five. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. And we are confident about you and the Lord that you both doing and will do what we are commanding. Now, may the Lord direct your hearts toward the love of God and in the endurance of Christ. So that begs the question, what is the endurance of Christ? Right. Let's go to part B. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we must get rid of every weight in the sin that clings so closely and run with endurance the race set before us. Keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Here it is. Here it is, guys. This is the, the endurance. For the joy set out for him, he endured the cross. Disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand throne of God. So what's the secret? What's the key? What is the example of Jesus Christ's endurance? The joy. He kept looking. One day I'll be in my father's house. One day all of his children will be home. One day the devil will be defeated. One day sin will be gone. One day there will be no sadness, tears, anger, or suffering ever again. One day happiness will return to my father's kingdom. 
That's the key. If we can't do that, we're lost. We have to put our hopes that I have a reward in heaven. One day this will all work out. One day I will be rewarded for my efforts. One day my father will say, good and faithful servant to me. One day I will be able to stand in the presence of my God and him give me a hug. Praise God. Next one, part one, Romans 15, 4 through 7. For everything that was written in former times was written for our instruction, so that through endurance and through encouragement of Scripture, we may have hope. So through the endurance and through encouragement of the Bible, we may have hope. Now may the God of endurance and comfort... Now, I love this. Now, the, now may the God of endurance and comfort you give you unity with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice... Glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive one another, then just as also as we also received the, the to God's glory. Right? So, what is part two? Let's go. We got the endurance, the encouragement of Scripture. Let's go to part two. Romans eight ten through um, Romans eight eighteen through twenty five. For I consider that our present suffering cannot even be compared to the coming glory that you will be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation or the earth was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because God who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of decay, new heavens, new earth, and to the glorious freedom of God's children. That's our hope. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers together until now. Not only this, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Right? So... Up at top, I'm, well, let me finish reading. Now hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with endurance. So up top it says, so that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we have this hope. The Bible tells us of our redemption, of our new heavens, of the new earth, of all things new. And at the bottom, part two, in the glorious freedom of God's children, eagerly await our adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we are saved. We are saved, we are saved, we are saved. So all of this act of faith is like just trusting God. Just trust me, trust me, trust me. That's why it's so profane to the world to live like a Christian does. Because he's like, why trust what I can't see when I can trust what I can see? Well, this is all gone. There's a new heaven and a new earth coming. This is all going away. It's not going to last. But what we receive and what we put our joy in, in, in our hope and what's coming is permanent. It'll be forever. Right. You will never like I, I try to explain it to people like it's like having a, a, a bank account of a billion dollars and you can spend all you want, but you never run out of a billion dollars. <laughs> There's just never no end to it. We can't even imagine the happiness, the joy, the peace, because we think happiness ends. Good times come to a close, but not in heaven. Imagine just being happy and giddy forever. Yeah, there's there's no downside. There's no letdown. They're like, oh, that's fun. I'm tired. I need a nap. No, it's like, let's keep going. I'm tired. Yeah, so we can enjoy it forever and just be at peace and at content and just at rest with the Lord. So as we close, Hebrews 10, 32 through 39. But remember the former days when you endured a harsh conflict of suffering after you were enlightened. In other words, remember the former days when you accepted Jesus Christ and you came to the Lord and started living for the Lord, right? Remember that. At times you were publicly exposed to abuse and affliction. At other times you came to share with others who were treated in that way. In fact, you shared the suffering of those in prison and you accepted the confiscation of your belongings with joy because you knew that you were certainly had a better and lasting possession. So do not throw away your confidence because it has a great reward. For you need endurance in order to do God's will and to receive what is promised. For you need endurance in order to do God's will key ingredient of being obedient, and to receive what is promised. For just a little longer, he who is coming will arrive and not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I take no pleasure in him. But we are not among those who shrink back and thus perish, but are among those who have faith and preserve their souls. Amen. Amen. Top of page 10. Romans 8, 31 through 39. 
What then shall we say by these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Indeed, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of uh, us all, how will he not also, along with him, freely give us all things? Freely give us all things. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? No, no, who has the power, the authority to say anything about you? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who will condemn? Christ is the one who died, and more than that, he was raised. Who is it? who is at the right hand of God, who is also interceding for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we encourage uh, encounter death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all things, we have more complete victory through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor heavenly rulers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? Did that paint a rosy picture of that you're going to live in a mansion, have a nice car, you get four squares a day? No, it's saying no matter where you are, no matter what God has called you to, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You will be rewarded. He, will, You will prove his love. You will gain holiness. You'll have a ministry of helping others that suffer. Right? And so all this takes endurance. All of us have to just realize the buckle up, Chuck, put on your seatbelt and just get ready for the ride and not give up. Let me read what I wrote. As we can clearly see, the Bible ta talks at great length for the need of endurance. This mighty weapon of faithfulness must be held onto with a death grip. If we give up the path and turn back or desire to turn back like the Israelites trip out of Egypt, the devil will have us for lunch. Yet in our endurance and our never give up, never give in attitude, we prove our love for God and Jesus. Mm -hmm. It is easy to live for and serve the Lord during good times, but it is in the deep trials of the night and rough valleys that reach down into hell itself that we prove our commitment. Stand fast, brothers and sisters, in the marathon of faith walking. If we do not give up, we will retain our reward in salvation. So let's serve up for the devil a giant heartburn sandwich and press on to the high calling of Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise, God. Praise, Praise God. God. Praise God. Amen. Let's thank pray. You, Jesus. Amen. Dear and Father, we praise you. We thank you for this understanding. I feel encouraged. I feel emboldened. I feel like you spoke to us today, Father. I just praise you and I thank you for that. Thank you. We need it. We need it desperately. I mean, beyond measure, beyond air, beyond food. If we don't have your encouragement, we don't have your hope. And if we don't have your spirit, Father, we are lost and we cannot do this. So just fall mightily upon us and upon your children. Father, pick us up in our weak moments. Give us endurance to continue on. We praise you. We thank you. You are worthy. You are so worthy. Jesus is so worthy. We give you our lives. We give you our everything. Father, you are so worthy. And we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Who can be against? If you feel you so led of the Lord, Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please, please visit, visit boyrants.com and scroll down the bottom of the name page for a paper link. Thank you because boy is the one to point on boyrants.com. Brotherlands.com I am who God says I am, not who the world says I am. Amen. Yeah, yeah praise God. That's right.